All right, welcome back to the last talk of the day before the discussion session. And I'm really happy that I can introduce Emre Nefti, our next speaker. Emre is a professor at UCA uh, Irvine in California. So he is on a couple of hours behind uh, Swiss and UK time. And uh, we are really glad that you could make it uh, and you're up that early. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk. All right, thank you very much, uh, so let me close this other window here, it's echoing. All right, okay, so uh, thanks all for being here and a huge audience, uh, so that's a uh, you know, great job uh, to the organizers. And um, I think this might actually be the largest audience I ever spoke to live, so uh, yeah, great. So I'll be talking today about uh, very related topics of what we've seen today with uh, Sanders and Francis talk and also Yulia's, um, giving, I'm giving a, a twist into neuromorphic computing and neuromorphic hardware because that's mainly what I'm concerned with. Um, and what I'm going to tell you is a story about how we can use all these nice theories about gradient-based learning for uh, you know, configuring and using neuromorphic hardware for, uh, for practical purposes. And even though this talk is really on neuromorphic hardware, you'll see actually uh, it's also interesting from a, a biological uh, perspective uh, as well. So my uh, goal, I'd say right now, is really to solve this task. I think you know this work by uh, Josh Tenenbaum. He had this nice figure showing that. Um, so uh, uh, if I give you uh, uh, information that these uh, uh, objects in the red boxes are called tufas, and I tell you to find the other tufas in this, uh, in this figure, you'll have no problem in doing this. Um, and this is quite remarkable, because from these three shots, you can actually learn an object that you've presumably never seen before if you haven't seen this uh, paper yet. And uh, you know we can do this well. We and obviously we've just you've just learned what these uh, uh, tufas are. Um, and wouldn't it be cool if we can do a build hardware system that would have the same capabilities in learning just uh, on site at the edge? Okay. So neuromorphic engineering is. Um, is basically the process of, of trying to capture the dynamics uh, of, of neurons and neural networks in an equivalent physical process. Um, and this basically occurs at, starting from the very low level. So we use uh, transistors as uh, uh, ion channels. So essentially you can show that the dynamics that govern ionic currents are the same that uh, govern the uh, electronic currents of substantial transistors, or more recently, these uh, resistive switching ramps. And you can uh, basically um, uh, build uh, from the bottom uh, up uh, you know, synapses, neurons, and, and full system. So uh, going up here is really the idea of synthesizing brain or this neuromorphic hardware. And um, the, the interest, the original interest in, in this field was really that after you've built these systems, you can break it down and analyze what you've built to understand it better. And this is the, the process of analysis by synthesis that's put forward by um, my Feynman here. Uh, Carver Mead was actually the main, uh, 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 the, the central figure behind neuromorphic engineering. And the, the central point here was that the our technology at the time, which was analog sil uh, silicon systems and still today, are, are similar to our brains, basically in that the wire is limited, uh, power is precious, and robustness is essential. So it's really, um, if you can build systems that respect these uh, three conditions, and you maybe learn something about the brain. So there's this idea of um, a hardware uh, and, uh, and uh, biology uh, a comparison through uh, by, by building uh, basically hardware. Okay, so neuromorphic engineering has uh, as a computer architecture is quite interesting because, I mean, as you all know, neurons have their own dynamics. Uh, it has, um, it's, um, um, uh, so spikes that are uh, output from each neuron basically encoded into this address uh, event bus. Um, that's basically a digital um, uh, a communication that transmits the address of the neuron that spiked, uh, which then gets decoded at the, at, at the receiving side. So the, the key idea here is that there are very rich local dynamics happening within the neuron, but only that uh, all or none spike is routed to the other neurons uh, in the network. 
from a computer engineering perspective, this is fabulous, right? Because it's very scalable. We only have these signals, these binary signals um, that are uh, communicated, but it's challenging, right? Because a neuron cannot arbitrarily sense the state of another neuron in the network. It has to do so through these uh, uh, spike events um, uh, to, to a large extent. So what we need here is basically uh, are basically algorithms that are robust to this local uh, uh, communication, this local computation. Um, and from a technology perspective, this is not so different from what we see in um, you know, computing and memory. You may have heard these, uh, these uh, uh, new hardware architectures where you're basically computing on the memory. And so this is a really real problem now in the technology industry. Basically, how can you do all these computations without local information and uh, every uh, every bit that you send actually is costing you uh, energy and, and, and space and time okay so that's basically the problem that we're trying to solve so you know we can I'll start here with just the overall view of you know us we have software and um, uh, and hardware and machine learning together are related through basically the existence of these you know, software machine learning frameworks which can get compiled onto uh, hardware such as GPUs and these other uh, you know new many core processors that are out there. So this is basically the ecosystem of, of machine learning. But I'm going to add here the block of neuroscience, which basically you know, says we, uh, we have software that can simulate neuroscience. For example, the Nest Initiative, um, uh, Nango, or the Brian Simulator. Um, we also have um, the uh, Basically, neuroscience can be directly implemented in hardware, so to say, through uh, this uh, different types of neuromorphic hardware, you know, developed in Zurich, Heidelberg, and or at Intel. Um, so, what I'm going to be interested in is basically creating this uh, uh, and using this third direction here, which is that we can try, we can understand neuroscience from a machine learning perspective, and we've seen a number of different talks today that uh, uh, contribute to that uh, to that connection, as well as you know other work in the field. So, uh, Several uh, researchers are now trying to use machine learning as uh, a metaphor or even as a model of what uh, uh, brains might be doing, or at least parts of, uh, of, of, this, uh, of, of the brain. So in order to build this uh, kind of neuromorphic hardware system and, and to, um, um, uh, to configure our systems, where I'm going to leverage all these different tools that are related uh, to machine learning, kind of a middle out approach. And uh, I, I'd like to make a disclaimer here is that I really mean machine learning in this general sense, not necessarily a deep learning sense. In fact, most of the networks that we use are not that very deep uh, for machine learning, uh, from deep learning um, uh, terms. So uh, how can we do this? So how can we relate neuroscience models to software and basically compile them onto neuromorphic hardware? There's been some work on this in the past. So I know I'd still like to you know, acknowledge that. So you know, Pine, which is you know, this Python neural network um, toolbox for uh, you know, using different simulation hardware backends on the same uh, configuration scheme. So you can build populations and connections, just map them onto hardware. Uh, we had something similar in the past and IBM built this really nice framework of correlates. So there's some work there in the configuration, but nothing that really relates to the machine learning, to the functional building blocks per se. Uh, on the other hand, you know, in deep learning, we have nice tools like TensorFlow and, and PyTorch, and even some of these are now starting to be implemented in neuromorphic hardware. But what we really need is, uh, you know, to, to push forward this idea of we need some high level functioning ecosystem that can you know, really uh, exploits the unique features of the hardware, mainly that it's a dynamical system, it's a physical, uh, it's a physical process. And so that's really what um, uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, so let's start from the basics here. So uh, we've seen these uh, 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 integrated and leaky integrated fire neurons a number of times here. Um, so I'm just going to, this is going to be a repeater or um, if you haven't uh, come to the uh, previous talks, well, here's, uh, uh, here it is for the first time. Um, so we have some membrane potential at time t plus one. I'm writing it here in discrete uh, time because that's how I'm going to be use it late, using it later, but there's no specific limitation in using discrete time dynamics. So that, that um, 
a membrane potential at that time step is given by the uh, previous time step, uh, a membrane potential times some leak term here, uh, plus some synaptic inputs from uh, the uh, inputs, um, maybe, and minus this term here, which acts as a reset potential. Um, so I want to be clear here that this is the uh, the simplest model that I can use just to present the the dynamics here. Uh, but you know we're not limited to these dynamics. Uh, you know all I'm, I suppose how in leaky integrant fire neuron works. We get uh, these inputs to generate these postsynaptic potentials, which uh, eventually elicit an, uh, a postsynaptic spike and then the reset. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is to cast these dynamics in the form of a computational graph, a little bit like we saw in, uh, in Francis' talk just uh, earlier, and just building it one by one. So because we have temporal dynamics, uh, this also means that we're going to have different states at different time steps. So and we need to keep those states in memory in order to build this computational graph. So we have this uh, membrane potential U. Um, I should have mentioned earlier, so we also have the spiking state, which is basically equal to, in this case, a step function of the membrane potential. If the membrane potential uh, basically uh, is larger than zero, then the neuron, the neuron spikes. So this means that we basically have an edge that goes from U to S, which really captures uh, this uh, computation here. Okay, so I'm now going to add these terms one by one. So we now we, uh, we basically relate the time uh, steps to each other through uh, the, the leak term here, which basically feeds UT minus one to U, uh, UT or T to T plus one uh, through a leak uh, term beta. We can have these synaptic connections going from the input spikes to uh, the membrane potential like this. And we assume here that this is the subsequent layer or the loss function. Uh, we have some recurrent connections that basically feed that state S back into U. And may, we can also subsume here this, um, um, this re uh, reset term uh, as well. So what we have here is, I mean, the particular form of this graph doesn't really matter, but it's the idea that this is the same graph as an unfolded artificial recurrent neural network. And so through this equivalence, what, the equivalence being that we started with a spiking neural network and we end up with something that's at least formally looks like a recurrent neural network. Through that equivalence, well, we can use then all the uh, wonderful tools of PyTorch and TensorFlow in order to simulate and even train uh, our neural network. And this is, we, we've seen this a number of times, so this backprop through time um, uh, discussion uh, as we saw in the, in the previous talks. So, so here's that framework here, uh, really the machine learning framework here applied to the spiking neural networks. Um, so the idea here is that we can just repeat the same workflow as a machine learning, which is that you create some objective function that captures uh, your, the performance on some task, you know, recognition, navigation, or whatever you're interested in, which itself is a function of the neural, neural network, uh, which has neurons of the type that we've just seen uh, before. And um, because we're going to be applying the same tools as, as machine learning, well, why not just use gradient descent? And that gradient descent on that loss function basically ends up in this uh, three-factor uh, learning rule that you may already be familiar with. And the three factors being that you know the derivative of the loss is basically something that uh, relates to uh, error. Uh, we have the derivative of the activation function, uh, the theta prime, I'll just call it, and some uh, synaptic eligibility. Uh, uh, quite a lot like we've seen um, in, the, in the previous talk. So the cool thing here is that, well, this gives us basically a mathematical framework for um, uh, basically deriving a learning rule or even a synaptic plasticity rule that we can implement um, on the hardware or, or, or in your biolog uh, biological model um, to train uh, that neural network. So that's, it's, a, it's a mathematical framework that relates plasticity to neuron dynamics. Um, and uh, that means that basically it gives us strategies for hardware design, right? So if I, if I build hardware uh, that has this type of neuron and I want to do gradient descent, I'd rather build a plasticity processor or some plasticity dynamics that can support this class of functions. Um, and obviously, as you've seen before, this, uh, this whole framework basically gives us a bridge between biological neural networks and, and, and machine learning and understand the whole learning process in at least one uh, fundamental way. 
Okay. Uh, this is, oh, by the way, so this is quite different in some ways to spike timing dependent plasticity, but also related. It's related by the fact that if you look at the updates that you obtain at the end of learning and, and you plot them on the graph similarly to SCP, you see that something that looks like this double exponential. Uh, this is actually a, a slightly different dynamic by Jean Pascal Pister, but, um, but the, the results also hold for these uh, three factor rules. Uh, it's different, however, in that uh, the, the actual learning rule is doing something uh, very uh, very different. It depends on these external errors and so on. So in some ways, it's uh, it's supportive of SCDP as an observation, but it also says that, well, if you want to use SCDP for solving practical tasks, maybe that's not the best option. Okay, so better use uh, some of these two-factor rules. Okay. So I talked that the the, the the title of the talk was about differentiable programming, and I'd like to talk to you about basic one uh, uh, solution to differentiable uh, uh, one part of differentiable programming, which is called auto differentiation. It turns out that at, the, at least personally, I think auto differentiation is really the hidden figure of deep learning success, um, which is you know hardware, basically GPUs, um, and auto differentiation. Auto differentiation is really that tool that does the magic that you've uh, seen in this little piece of uh, you've seen this little piece of PyTorch. You've done this multiple times. Basically, you can calculate your output and you calculate your loss. Very complicated function, but then just some magic happens when you just say loss dot backward. Just calculates all those gradients. Uh, at least in the beginning, when I was using Theano, this was like, wow, how is this even possible? It turns out that actually uh, auto differentiation is a field in itself that exists uh, since a very very long time. Um, uh, well, very long being uh, in the uh, uh, 20, uh, 30 years, um, which has been applied to scientific computing uh, a lot in the past. But the basic idea here is that we can reuse this uh, auto differentiation um, on neural networks by, by, by building these differentiable programs composed of these building blocks uh, of, of neural networks, which are feed forward, convolutional, and recurrent elements. So if this can be done for um, artificial neural networks. It can also uh, be done actually for you know spiking neural networks as well as this neuromorphic hardware. And instead of programming our GPU, we just program our neuromorphic hardware. What we need to need to do this is basically to build the primitives, the differentiable primitives, um, in our uh, software. So the neuromorphic TensorFlow doesn't exist yet, but that's basically what we're working on. Okay. So now let's take a step back and just go back to this three factor rule that I was discussing earlier. So the three factors here is that uh, it, what we want to do is calculate, of course, the update on the uh, synaptic weights. It has these three terms here. Um, and the, uh, there are a couple of challenges in computing these terms and the ones that I've highlighted in blue. The first one is that this activation function is non-differentiable. Um, Sander Bote actually gave a really nice talk about, uh, uh, about this non-differentiability and how uh, 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 his approach actually led to the, uh, 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 this idea of surrogate gradients, uh, which is basically that we're replacing that uh, uh, non-differentiable or this um, uh, not non-differentiable term by a smooth one for the purposes of optimization only. And and Friedemann puts this in a really nice way. It's basically like you're you're creating a surrogate network in which you're calculating the gradients and applying those gradients onto your original spiking network, which is a little bit like you know going down this approximate uh, smooth uh, valley here. So that's an easy problem, um, and it's uh, largely solved, at least for not too uh, uh, deep networks. Um, this the second hard uh, problem here, is actually the. Um, it is the uh, deep uh, spatial credit assignment problem. As you know, so if you want to calculate the loss, the global loss with respect to your local spike, well, you need to know how that output spike is going to affect the loss, and maybe and depends on all the computations that happen from that neuron to the output. Um, so uh, this is a hard problem. I mean, obviously, credit assignment is something that we've heard a lot, um, and that's really the goal. Uh, uh, so neural networks really uh, training uh, solves this problem through uh, backpropagation by backpropagating the errors uh, through the network. Um, this is not very biologically plausible, as we've seen before. Um, so one way to, um, um, uh, as we've seen in the other talks, I'm sorry. Um, so one way to overcome this problem is to backpropagate the um, the the errors randomly so that you don't have to have the symmetric transpose here or you can broadcast those error signals uh, uh Francia was talking about this just in the previous uh, talk 
Um, and this uh, other method that we've been very fond of is this idea of local errors. Basically, you can define a, a, a specific loss function for every, uh, every layer and train that layer uh, only with that loss function. I like to see this whole uh, crit assignment problem as a game of Chinese whispers. I think it's a nice way of explaining it. Um, so if you have some input coming here at the left and the output is here, basically that in the beginning that um, and, and your net, this table is your neural network. So that information gets uh, uh, corrupted and then the output is very different from the input. But then back part, what back propagation would do is that just come to that output and say, okay, the correct answer was this. And then he would basically pass that message back into the input. Um, and then we have this uh, forward and backward phases. So you see that forward and backward phase basically introduces this delay that you really need to do this uh, two-phased uh, learning. Um, uh, feedback alignment or direct feedback alignment is that instead of waiting for it, instead of um, giving the uh, correct answer to the output, you just broadcast it to the entire table. And local errors is basically like every person has uh, a partner who tells him what the correct answer is for, for that layer, so to say. Okay, so that's just one way to see um, the, these different approaches of backpropagation. Uh, so there are some solutions and they work uh, reasonably well. Um, the hard, the, uh, things become really hard when you have to do the temporal credit assignment. So remember, I mean, we're working with a spiking neuron which has its own dynamics and eventually the hardware because it's, you know, uh, is also a physical process also has its own uh, dynamics. So how do you solve the temporal credit assignment problem? Back propagation through time is one way, but I'd like to give you, take one step back and talk to you about um, auto differentiation, which is really, you know, uh, the the fundamental solution to um, uh, temporal credit, has the fundamental solution to the credit assignment problem. So, the um, so this is just general. Just uh, you know, forget about spiking neurons uh, for for this line. So the gradient of some function composition. Let's say we have some function f of g of x with parameters theta. Uh, the gradient is going to be a product of Jacobian matrices, right? So, and these, every term here, like we had in the three-factor rule, is basically a Jacobian uh, matrix. Well, what you can do in order to calculate this gradient is that back, uh, is that you can just multiply these, uh, multiply these matrices, basically do this product of matrix. You can start from the left and you go to the right. And if you do this, this is like doing back propagation because you start from the loss function and you go down maybe to, for example, the, the layer where you have these particular weights, assuming this were a neural network. So in back propagation through time, not tie, is um, basically the application of back propagation into this unrolled network. But that's that's reverse mode, uh, automatic differentiation. It's basically what uh, TensorFlow and, and PyTorch, all these machine learning frameworks natively implement this reverse mode. But there's also a forward mode because you see, I did this product of Jacobians here from left to right, but I could also do it from right to left. Right, so I can start with this Jacobian here, and then multiply uh, uh, this one here. So it's basically as if I'm just putting parentheses in different places um, in this um, product of Jacobians. Um, so that's one way to see the forward mode automatic differentiation, which in uh, uh, in recurrent neural networks is basically called uh, real-time recurrent learning. I'm sorry, I should have actually written down the uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, the acronym here. So um, it turns and the reason why we don't use forward mode automatic differentiation is just because it's computationally expensive. You can imagine that you know, you, if you if you uh, uh, you know this Jacobian here is basically uh, a much larger Jacobian than this one here. This is actually a vector uh, on the left and the right. We have uh, a matrix here. So if you go from right to left here. Uh, basically you're going to be doing matrix matrix multiplications. If you go from left to right, you're going to be doing vector matrix multiplications. Okay, so that's, that's I'm just giving here a very hand wavy uh, description of the problem here. And in fact, this is not how auto differentiation is implemented. You can be implemented in a much more efficient way, but it gives you this, uh, the uh, I think the intuitive idea of what does reverse mode, what does uh, forward mode, and what later I'll be talking about mixing forward and, and uh, reverse mode. Um, okay, so let's come back to this temporal credit assignment problem. So what we have here is, let me just quickly check the time. Okay, so um, 
we can apply uh, these two modes, so reverse automatic differentiation and forward automatic differentiation to our graph. So if we do it, then this is the same graph as we had earlier with the integrated fire neurons. So if you, what you do here is that basically you start at time step t, and you propagate forward. As you propagate forward, you you uh, hit this loss function. Then from that point on, you can uh, you take the gradient and then you back propagate, right? So this is the back propagation through time. We've seen it many times. Um, what you see here is that you only get an update after uh, t plus seven steps, right? That's basically all the steps you need to do in order to go to the loss and then back. Okay, so that means that basically your updates are delayed. Right? So, and plus this uh, neuron would need to keep a history of everything that happened in order to calculate those, um, uh, those gradients. In forward uh, uh, automatic differentiation, um, basically you just, you carry forward all the information that you need for calculating the gradients. And this really comes by the fact that as you're calculating this product of Jacobians from right to left, you're basically going with the flow of time, so to say. Um, and the cool thing when you do this is that you see, as soon as you hit that loss function, you have your update. So this is a, an online learning rule, okay? If you look at the complexity of this problem, I'm not going to detail why uh, you end up with these complexities, but um, it turns out that forward uh, automatic differentiation has a terrible uh, time complexity. It's, it's a quartic on the number of neurons and cubic in space, whereas a backprop through time is squared and n, but it has this dependence on time, which is very annoying. And partly the uh, reason why we were not able to apply backpropagation through time in these very large spike neural networks is because, uh, it's because of this uh, time term here. Uh, we need to unroll a lot of steps, and that just blows up memory. Um, another uh, uh, nice thing, actually, about forward automatic differentiation is that you don't really need transposes, right? Because you're you're propagating everything forward, and so you don't, ne never actually um, need to uh, re uh, uh, reverse the the direction of these arrows, uh, so to say. Um, and automatic differentiation is online, but it turns out that you still need some non-local information. So forward AD doesn't really solve the problem of local computations, local learning, as, as I've started with today. Um, so what can we do? So what I'm going to talk to you about is basically an approach. Um, it's, it's a type of mixed uh, automatic differentiation um, with some approximation on the forward automatic differentiation part. And um, what we'll result with is uh, an algorithm which has a time complexity that's, uh, that's uh, squared, uh, space complexity that's, uh, that's linear, um, and we don't need uh, transposes. It's online and it's local. So it really hits all the points here uh, that you know, it's uh, uh, this basically an efficient uh, uh, learning rule that we can implement in hardware. Um, I can't go into the very details of what we're, uh, all the details that we're going to go there, but I want to give you some gist of it in the following slides. So here's that graph again. Uh, so this, in this case, is the forward, uh, the forward AD graph. What we want to calculate, uh, very similarly actually to Francis' talk, um, is basically this loss term here with respect to the parameters theta. Actually, in this case, they're going to be the Ws. Um, we can decompose this in two parts: so the loss with respect to u and the loss with respect to ut uh, of ut with respect to those parameters. So this is really the part that pulls in the temporal component here. If I expand this um, across the unfolded graph, I end up with this um, equation here, right? So we have du d, uh, d theta at time t is equal to some term that captures the dynamics. You see, basically, we have ut, uh, uh, der uh, derivative of ut with respect to ut minus 1. Um, and uh, you can show that basically you also end up with this other term, ut minus 1 d, d theta, which is the same as this one here. Okay, so basically we have what we have here is a recursive relationship of gt um, with itself that pulls in these dynamics. It's, a, it's, it's almost a mirror recursive relationship with respect to what's happening uh, in the neural network. We also have another term here, which is the d of ut and uh, d theta t. So using this more compact notation I have in those under braces, basically I end up with this uh, recursive relationship here. So this is the, re uh, the, the, the main recursive relationship we need to uh, re retain in order to, uh, in order to compute 
in order to compute these updates in, in forward uh, AD. And all this story about synaptic uh, eligibilities or neuron eligibilities, they actually come from this uh, a relationship here, which can be shown from uh, basically automatic differentiation. Okay, so this, um, another step that we can do here is that, well, you see actually these dynamics, they actually capture these arrows that go from T plus one to T plus two, right? But they come from two different places, right? So I have two arrows here. And so I can decompose those two uh, components, one that is I'll call explicit uh, or uh, um, uh, basically explicit recurrences that may come from other neurons, and the implicit recurrences that come from this may come from the same neuron. So I'll call this HI and HE. Okay, I'm going to give you more detail on that. But I'm just going to give you a talk to you about one trick here is that these f of t's, which is basically the derivative of u with respect to, that, to the weights at that time step. Well, why calculate them in forward mode, right? I mean, I, I can, we can, everything is happening at the same time step, so I can just back propagate those uh, those signals um, uh, across that time step. And this is a little bit like, you know, the the uh, uh, the action potential back propagation within the same neuron. You can think of it uh, uh, in that way. And so this is where we mix basically these forward automatic differentiation um, and and reverse automatic differentiation. Um, but I want to come back to this uh, to the separation on these terms because this is really where we gain this huge uh, we you know we go from this quartic uh, time complexity to the quadratic one. And it's the following here. So when you have implicit dynamics, so the implicit dynamics here is inherently diagonal, meaning that it only affects the neuron in itself. This is how we defined it. As a result, so if you multiply diagonal uh, matrices, so in this case, this is kind of a special diagonal matrix, well, you end up with something that's also diagonal. So that the spark, that diagonal property is preserved uh, across the recurrence uh, forward AD. Uh, for explicit recurrences, this is not the case, right? So if you propagate that, this diagonal basically becomes this dense uh, matrix here. Uh, the immediate Jacobians themselves are, are diagonal by design of neural networks. So what we can do here is basically just say, okay, we're, we can't do this, right? Because this, just, this is quadratic, we're never gonna solve this problem. So we just ignore this red part. And a lot of these, you know, the surrogate gradient learning and also the work that we've done in Decol um, um, and, and possibly also EPROP, I'm not sure I understand all the details there, but they, you know, they rely on some form of sparsification, uh, sparsity and, and approximation as we have here. In fact, this same picture also applies to the case where you have more complex dynamics. For example, Sandar Bote talked about these adaptive uh, neurons that you know, Guillaume Belek and the Wolfgang Maas team have, have developed. And the, the same story applies there, where instead of having diagonal matrices, you just have block diagonal matrices. The block diagonal property is preserved uh, across, uh, across time. So basically, uh, what we do is we're just taking this yellow part uh, here, and because these are sparse matrices, we're just computing those sparse, uh, uh, the elements that are non-zero, and this greatly reduces the complexity um, in, in our case from you know, quadratic, uh, from quartic to quadratic in time, and from cubic to linear in space. Uh, quadratic if you have um, non-linear dynamics. Um, by the way, this has also been applied to standard um, uh, machine learning, where you know, a team in um, uh, DeepMind show that uh, basically sparse approximations to these uh, uh, explicit dynamics outperforms uh, in learning speed uh, back propagation through time using uh, LSTMs. So this is something that's also known from the standard machine learning community. Okay, so we apply these ideas to um, you know, learning. Uh, I, again, so I'm interested in neuromorphic hardware. So we actually use these neuromorphic sensors, uh, in this case designed by, uh, the, by any labs, um, which you know, capture dynamics uh, in um, the uh, 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 basically sp the spike events um, that basically you know, just in the end produce this cloud of points. And we, we, these cloud of points is basically a large uh, spike train um, a large dimensional spike train, and we process it using the spiking uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, we use here these uh, local loss functions. These are very similar in, in spirit to these uh, this uh, kind of natural uh, EPROP idea that Franz was talking about. And we get pretty good results. Um, you know, this 4% on this gesture recognition data set um, uh, from uh, IBM. Um, that There's some better results than we have, uh, I'm showing here now, this uh, after we published. But basically, I think this is the best 
results on online training. This training was fully online. So really for every time step, after every time step, we make an update. Okay, so um, I think just go, I'd like to go very quickly over some of the problems that are solved and some of them that are open. Basically we can learn in multi-layers, for example, in local learning, that's what I showed you. Uh, we can map parameters to artificial neural networks to spike neural networks, and that Bode talked about this one. Um, we can learn uh, these, uh, with sparse approximations and implicit recurrences. So, um, and that's, you know, uh, several people have worked on this, but, you know, partly also DeepMind. Um, we can also learn with low precision uh, weights and uh, it, it, it learn the structure of the spike in neural networks. Some of the open problems is basically learning with, uh, you know, uh, uh, without catastrophic forgetting um, and uh, learning with local losses. Um, very deep networks, we can't really do that, but do we really need them? Um, and some synaptic plasticity with the explicit uh, recurrence. That, that was red blocks that I was talking about. So um, I'd like to finish uh, up with uh, basically what I started with, which was this, you know, learning of the tufas. Um, uh, in this case, you want to do it in hardware because, yeah, we can't. Uh, this is was the, the, the Intel Luihi chip is a neuromorphic chip which has uh, programmable learning capabilities. Basically, the chip has somewhat 128,000 uh, uh, neurons each. You can compose the neural compartments in any uh, in some uh, restricted but you know uh, programmable ways. And what we uh, what we did is that um, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to skip this one here, just in the interest of time. But what we did is that we basically pre-trained a functional simulator of that neuromorphic hardware using backpropagation through time. And because it's a functional simulator, it's compatible with that Intel uh, Intel hardware. We map it onto that hardware, and we basically learn uh, those um, uh, new um, uh, gestures, in this case, online using the plasticity processor uh, here. So really, I mean, this is taking us from the full way, starting from you know spiking neurons and understanding um, what how can we do learning in these spiking neural networks? We end up with this reverse mode and this forward mode and, and um, uh, uh, learning. And here, what we're basically doing is that, you know, we, we, we can train these networks on a GPU, so why not? We just pre-train them on the back part through time and then do this um, uh, on one-shot learning on the device using these tools of uh, forward uh, automatic differentiation. So it's really basically few-shot learning um, of uh, something similar to this TUFAS. So there's a lot, we, we can do this a lot better. The, um, uh, the accuracies are not uh, top-notch yet, um, but this was our first step and uh, was very convincing, at least to us. Okay, so I'd just like to uh, summarize a couple of points here uh, that, well, coming back also to Lokun's uh, uh, comments that uh, uh, Sandra was talking about. Um, so I think spiking neural networks in some cases can be as good as artificial neural networks. So I think indeed there is you know, something there and it makes sense to build hardware for this. Um, we can build efficient implementations um, and, and basically use this machine learning as a guiding principle. Um, and we can use sparks approximations of re real-time recurrent learning um, and, and this mixed mode automatic differentiation. We can reuse the tools of machine learning um, for, for training and configuring hardware. Um, and so that's, uh, that's it. So I'd like to thank the people here. Now, I want to say that actually a lot of the work that what I presented here was also done in collaboration with uh, Friedemann um, and all uh, my students and various collaborators here. Thanks, Amber. I guess I have a bunch of questions about that work then. Uh, <laughs> so actually, Dan already dropped the bomb in terms of questions. Um, and I'm glad I don't have to answer, but you have. I'm just going to read the question. Uh, so Dan would like to know, is there a mathematical reason why the surrogate trick, uh, trick work, should work? It feels kind of magical. Well, I don't think it's very magical in that, uh, because I mean, uh, I think so. Sandra gave a, a, a good talk earlier, uh, uh, a, a good reason earlier that basically just making this linear assumption, which is as if a little bit like a straight through estimator, if you're familiar with that, that already gives you some uh, some learning signal. So basically, what you're doing here is that you are just I'm just going to be paraphrasing uh, the the fact that you know we don't have a mathematical foundation of why this is working, but it's just in practice it works very well, um, and uh, the 
I, I, yeah, I, th I think there's the, the, the ball is out there as why mathematically this works, but in practice, we're happy that, you know, it works well. I just put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, we don't fully know mathematically why it works. Intuitively, it seems fine, but yeah, it would be nice to have a full mathematical understanding eventually, I guess. Okay, so um, yeah, so the next question is from Said, who asks um, Input and output spikes are rare events, but the circuit gradient learning computes error gradients at all. The time steps. Can we can we uh, can we just do it at firing times? Can we do it event based? Yeah, uh, we we have a paper on this. Um, it's uh, there's a, it's an AI cast and the other one's actually on review. But you know we can post it on archive. So basically, what you can do there is that you can instead of just like an SCDP, you know, you trigger learning on pre and post events. Um, so those are the two factors we had. Remember, our factors are error and pre and post um, in a hand wavy way. Well, why not do the triggering on the error events? Uh, and it turns out that this works very well. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense, right? So you should only make an update if you've made uh, uh, a downstream error. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a side. You can do exactly that. Cool. So here's another question by Dylan. Um, is there a reason why you need a local loss per layer? Why are circuit gradients alone not enough to build deep spiking networks? Uh, they are, uh, actually. If you're using backpropagation through time, there is no problem in using surrogate gradients across multiple layers. The issue is, which um, I kind of uh, sweep this under the rug, um, uh, it's true. But basically, if you have, um, see this uh, orange uh, part here. Basically, this um, directly goes from the loss function down to uh, the membrane potential. If this went through uh, several steps, then things become more complicated. Um, and it's difficult to solve this problem uh, using this uh, online learning algorithm. Okay, So if you're using backpropagation through time, you can do it. But if you're using um, these online methods that rely on this, that basically get rid of that explicit dynamics, you know, the, the red block that I was talking uh, about, then you can't do this anymore. Okay. And that's the same reason uh, I think that also, for example, EPROP also has these learning signals that are sent directly to the neurons because you just can't learn uh, credit temp spatial temporal credit assignment across multiple neurons in a tractable way. But I think that's material for discussion later. Absolutely is, yes. Um, okay, here's another question by Manvi, who says, I should ask, uh, so how would local errors work in deep networks? That is, how would you define targets for hidden layers? So, so there are many ways of doing this. We went for simplicity because I'm, you know, I'm really interested in building the software for this and um, letting the community actually uh, uh, build cool applications. Uh, what we did here was, oh, sorry, there you go. So basically, we use the approach of um, um, Hesham Mustafa, who that basically has these local classifiers with the uh, target labels provided for each uh, layer. And that's the target label here. Um, so this works well in practice and it works well for classification. Um, if you don't have uh, those uh, local layers, but you can use, you know, uh, contrastive losses um, uh, and, you know, similarity measures uh, that has also been used by, uh, you know, the Knuckland has a paper, an uh, interesting paper on that. So, yes, you have to build these things by hand or, uh, as we've seen in the previous talk, you can also train them using you know, evolutionary methods or, uh, you know, meta uh, backpropagation meta learning. You can also train these local loss functions. So I think there's a lot of interesting things to explore there. Very well. Um, by the way, sorry, Manvi is a she, not a he. I mixed this up. I'm very, very sorry. So um, next question. Um, is, and I think uh, you probably have a slide for this, is, is there a good reference for these spatial and temporal scaling rules uh, forward and backward learning? I've stared at them a few times and can't figure it out. Uh, what do you mean by scaling rule? Maybe that's a phone typo. I imagine pri propagation rules, I guess. Spatial, yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay, so let's, assuming that this is spatial temporal, 
learning rule. Um, then uh, I would recommend this really nice article by uh, Christina Seven uh, and her lab that really explains this forward and backward in the same article and tries to make comparisons between them. Um, our paper is not out yet, so I can't re refer to that one. Um, so, and that, that is completely independent of spiking neurons. So it's only an artificial uh, uh, neural networks. Um, if you want the spiking version of it, then you, know, you can also refer to our uh, previous surrogate gradient uh, work. Um, but if you have trouble in understanding the backward learning or the reverse automatic differentiation, it's completely normal. It's, it's quite um, unintuitive, it turns out. Um, I would also say that the, um, there's this really nice article on automatic differentiation by, by Din uh, here um, that is uh, also a fantastic uh, description of the field and um, with working examples of forward and backward AD. Cool, thanks. So here's another question by the same um, person. So in electronic hardware, is there really a significant cost associated with non-local credit assignment? And what is this cost? Oh yeah, so that's the same, it's the cost of communication. So it turns out that in hardware, um, the one of the biggest uh, prices you pay um, is obviously the clock, but also uh, sending signals from one place to another. Um, so uh, if your memory is, for example, situated in, in a RAM, which is in the, today still a different chip than where your computation is happening, you have to wait a lot of uh, cycles. So that's a long time. And all that communication basically takes a lot of, a lot of power. So if you, can, if you can put the memory where the computation is, as it's done, for example, this in-memory processing um, uh, systems, um, then you don't have to communicate and that makes a huge difference. And the credit assignment, the non-local aspect of the credit assignment is directly related to this uh, communication uh, cost. So um, yeah, so significant. Okay, cool. Um, right, so there's one more question. I'm gonna to try to invite the uh, user on screen. Um, and see what he or she says, because I'm not entirely sure what IFA is, but maybe you know it. So the question is, um, or is, it, is the person coming? I don't No, looks like no. So the question is, is there a relation in your opinion between the concept of combining forward plus backward auditive and, ah, here we go. Yes. <laughs> so what's the past? Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I was uh, yeah, okay. I can ask that. Like um, seeing the the whole concept that you presented about the forward and reverse uh, auto diff, um, I could not let's say help it not think that there might be a connection to the indirect feedback alignment um, and the theorems, uh, the theorem practically that Norwick uh, mm -hmm. introduced. So. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in mm -hmm. feedback alignment, but I was just, I would just uh, welcome comments on that, like mm -hmm. to understand your perspective. I, I do actually. So, I mean, you're entirely correct, right? So if, in this slide here, I was talking about this feedback alignment and direct feedback alignment. Um, and uh, that's basically, if you're, if you're in reverse, uh, actually this can also be applied to forward mode, um, but, uh, Basically, if you're uh, in, in this reverse mode case, I mean, you can back propagate those errors directly from those layers, thereby obviating mm -hmm. the need for doing this spatial crit assignment problem uh, across yeah. layers. Um, things become a little bit more complicated if you have the time as well, because then you have to broadcast the events in space and in time as well. It turns out that broadcasting in time is very problematic, right? Because you're, you will be learning something, the outputs, based on some previous input. And there's a mismatch between um, in the timing of these two uh, events, basically events when the error comes and, and the input. Basically, you'll be calculating uh, updates based on new inputs, but the errors are calculated based on old inputs. So that doesn't work. Okay, so what you need to do is really uh, solve this problem with the taking in the temporal dynamics into account. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see if are there ways that we can do um, you know, feedback alignment also in time without 
having this problem of mismatch, a time mismatch. But if I may ask, like, uh, I mean, from my kind of understanding, at least from a, a probabilistic approach, unfolding in time is yet another way of seeing a graphical uh, model, right? So you don't care mm -hmm. if it's spatial or if it's temporal at the end of the day, right? That's absolutely true. Yeah. And the so, the the difference here is that. Oh, sorry. sorry you're what I was thinking is that in the indirect feedback alignment, you go back to a certain layer from the loss function, and then you go again forward. So you have a part of it that goes backwards from the loss, and part of it that goes forward to some intermediate layers. So the way I was imagining it mm -hmm. is that. To a certain point, you have a signal coming from the loss directly, which is kind of your global mm -hmm. signal. Mm -hmm. And then you have a feed-forward part, and you could right. have a backward part. And, you know, the temporal one would come from one direction, the spatial mm -hmm. one that's right. coming from another direction. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of the, uh, the gist behind what we're trying to do with that mixed-mode automatic differentiation. Uh, that you can basically what you can do is you can forward propagate some of the gradients and you can back propagate some of the gradients that come from the feature, which you can approximate uh, as well. Uh, and then you can, the place where this joins basically you can make an update. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's possible. And you can, and that back propagation can be done, at least spatially, it can also be done with, um, with you know, direct feedback alignment. I, I think that's, a, you know, that's a perfectly valid point. I think you're, you're right on. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot for the question. And thanks a lot for all the questions, actually. Um, and I'm just going to ask Dan whether he wants to quickly come back up on stage. And I'd like to thank you again, Emre, for uh, closing a great day of talks here with a great talk yourself. It was fun listening. And uh, yeah, so as you all know, next step is that we're going to rejoin in like 20 minutes or so for the discussion session, and I hope many of you can make it. And uh, we've seen now that roughly two to 250 people are usually online at the moment. Um, so we think we can do it on Zoom. And uh, okay, and Dan is coming in case he has some extra um, instructions for us, but I've seen that the link for the Zoom chat has always gone out. And um, so the idea is that whenever you've uh, finished your pee or coffee break, that you can hang out in, the, in this Zoom room and then in about 20 minutes we will join. Um, and there will be basically a moderated panel discussion going on with the speakers and with the audience. And all the questions that you haven't had time to ask or that took some time to percolate through, they should be asked there. Uh, today, the topic will be, as with the talks, more, mostly centered around first technical issues um, and, and technical constraints, how do you actually train spiking on networks? But then we also want to start a little bit the discussion about, okay, we can train spiking on networks now, but what next? So what, what do we do with this now? How do we apply this both in an applied sense and in the computational neuroscience sense to understand how the brain works? And I'm very much looking forward to this discussion with you, and I hope to see all of you. Dan, did I forget something? No, I think we're good. Um, yep. All right, then, um, yeah, thanks again all, to all the speakers and to the audience. It's been grand, and uh, see you in 20 minutes. Okay, I, I, by the way, I should say I'll, I'll post the, the link to the, um, to the Zoom meeting in the chat here, actually, as well, because it's probably going to be useful. Thanks. Okay. All right, I guess I can close now, right? I think you can close, yeah. So, so see you in a bit. Thanks a lot.